Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us on your Tuesday afternoon. We're so excited to have you here. Thank you sincerely. I know that there's a lot going on in the world right now, but it's wonderful that you're spending time with us um, and, and talking about books still. I'm, I'm so grateful. Thank you, thank you, thank you. My name is McKaylee. I work at Tattered Cover Bookstore, and we're here uh, talking about Larry Watson's newest book. Um, and I'm, I'm excited to continue hosting author events, um, even virtually. I know that we necessarily cannot meet together in person um, and be the community space that Tattered Cover is known to be. However, we're happy to do that online virtually with you all in this manner. So thank you for doing that. I just want to give you a couple of updates about the store. For instance, um, we are we have open stores, which is really exciting. Um, three of our four stores are open right now, um, which includes our three main locations, Aspen Grove down in the south suburbs, which is open seven days a week. And then our Colfax Avenue and our historic lower downtown locations are open every single day of the week except Tuesdays. So not today, but you can come in tomorrow um, and get a copy of Larry's latest book. Um, you can also always order it online. Our website's open 24 seven and we are caught up on getting caught up on orders and we thank you guys so much for continuing to support local independent bookstores. We hope you're doing so too um, by supporting local restaurants, mom and pop shops around the area. Uh, we really are so grateful for that gift um, that we can stay open during these turbulent times. I wanna also just say that closed captioning is enabled for those who might need it. You just hit the button, the CC button that's down at the bottom of your video screen that you're watching us on right now. We are gonna be having a Q&A section uh, for this. And so if you have any questions, feel free to type them in the chat below. I already see that some of you are already active on there. Thank you for doing that. But that's where you'll ask the questions if you have any of them uh, for this event. And I'll announce to everybody when we are taking those questions. But now it is my honor to introduce Larry Watson, the author that we're gonna be having join us today. Raised in Bismarck, North Dakota, Larry Watson is the author of 10 critically acclaimed books, including the best-selling Montana, 1948. His fiction has been published internationally and has received numerous prizes and awards. His essays and book reviews have appeared in the Los Angeles Times, the Washington Post, the Chicago Sun-Times, the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, and other periodicals. He and his wife live in Kenosha, Wisconsin. A film adaptation of Watson's novel, Let Him Go, is currently in production with Kevin Costner and Diane Lane and is due to release in 2020. And so it's my pleasure to welcome Larry Watson. I'm gonna turn on his mic and ask him to join me. Hi, Larry. <laughs> there we are. Hello. 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 Yeah, thanks for the introduction. Oh, it's my pleasure. What a great introduction with your prospective movie coming out. That's exciting. And um, and talking about all of your best-selling novels. And then, of course, Kenosha, Wisconsin, which we were chatting about before. <laughs> so that's really exciting. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. It's good to be back with with or with Tattered Cover. I've had just lots of great visits there in the past. Oh, thank you. Yes, we're here in spirit, even though we're in our, our respective homes. And like I said, creating an online community is what we're trying to do right now until we can all be a community together in person again. So I'd love it if you could tell us a little bit more about this book, The Lives of uh, Edie Pritchett. Um, Richard, excuse me. <laughs> sure. Um, well, I, I always have trouble with this, with summarizing one of my own books. It's sort of like the, like the elevator pitch. pitch. But I never, well, if I you could do it in a paragraph, it wouldn't be a novel, so. I, sure, you're right, you're right. Um, and it's a, even more difficult with this novel because it doesn't really have a single plot line or single narrative arc that travels from beginning to end. Um, it was much easier with my two previous novels, uh, Let Him Go, Grandma and Grandpa go after their grandson and all hell breaks loose. And with As Good As Gone, Grandpa comes to stay with his grandkids and all hell breaks loose. <laughs> but in the case of Edie Pritchard, it's, it's three novella-sized stories and they take place at 20 year in intervals. And though each story has elements that appear in or, or parallel elements in the other, they're also somewhat self-contained. But at the heart of each section is Edie Pritchard. So we see her in 1967, 1987, and 2007, when she's 24, 44, and 64. And I've tried to show how she changes 
over time, but, and this was just as important to me, how certain features of Edie's character and personality remain constant over time. And there's a particular complication, a particular conflict in Edie's life that also doesn't change. And that's her struggle to define herself rather than be defined by others and to be seen as a whole person and not simply as a beautiful girl. Men, especially, but not exclusively, want to project on her an identity that suits their needs rather than hers. Uh, Edie was born and raised in Gladstone, Montana, and the novel's first section finds her there. She's married to Dean Linderman, her high school boyfriend. Dean has a twin brother, Roy, and Roy is Dean's opposite in many respects. Roy is a smooth-talking womanizer, and he's been pursuing Edie in one manner or another since high school. Inevitably, the brothers fight over Edie. In the second section, Edie has split from Dean, from his brother, and she has remarried. She's still living in Montana, but far from Gladstone. A phone call from someone in Edie's past arouses a violent response of jealousy in her husband, and Edie leaves, taking her teenage daughter with her. And then in the third section, Edie's back in Gladstone. She's living alone, no longer married, and she seems content with her life. But again, a phone call rouses Edie from her quiet life, and this time it's Edie's granddaughter who's in trouble. She's been traveling the country with a pair of feral brothers, and she asks Edie to come to her rescue, and Edie answers the call. So there, that's a no. brief outline of the novel. The elevator has stopped. Great. <laughs> no, I, I, I want to ask you about the three novella size stories because I found them very interesting. It's almost like a collection of short stories, but really I found it being a theater major, as we had talked about previously, as a three act structure, so to speak, of someone's life. What was appealing to you about that structure for this particular story? Well, um, I sort of made it up as I went along. And no, away. that's okay. <laughs> I, I originally thought that that first section would be the novel. Mm -hmm. and uh, But I got to the end, and though some, some part of Edie's life closed off at the end of that first section, um, a good deal more of it opened up, at least in my mind. I mean, uh, uh, I thought originally that that those three, Edie and and Roy and Dean Linderman, would share center stage. Um, but as I wrote, Edie more and more became the primary character and um, a fascinating character for me. I mean, she just seemed to have so much depth and complexity. And so I knew, I knew there, was, there was more. And um, so I, I, I decided to see if I couldn't tell her life by doing those by doing it at three different critical moments in her life and to do those at 20 year intervals. And so in each of those sections, there's, there's a road trip. There are some other elements that are common to all three parts. And so, well, the other obvious common part is Edie herself. And it was really interesting to see her voice evolve because there's obviously some consistencies as she is the same person, but she goes through several changes in her life. And I'm curious what that was like for you finding her voice, the constant thread, but then also finding out how it changed. What did your process look like to find her voice in each of those sections? You know, uh, and I think this is probably why I was able to continue writing about her. It, it just seemed to be there. You yeah. know, um, sometimes I finish a, a, a section of a book and that's it, it goes away. But the ED character and the voice, or maybe I should say, the way of telling Edie's story just stayed with me. And, and no, and it's a great constant throughout the book. And yet, like I said, it changes throughout, which I, which I just found very interesting. And, you know, I, I want to know where did the idea come from, from this book? You know, you talked about the fact that it starts with this first story and as you kept writing it, that you kept discovering more, but what was that seed or that first kernel that started with this trio that you had? Well, there were a couple things. Uh, first of all, Great, the, tw tell me. <laughs> uh, the twin thing. Um, 
you know, and I, I wrote about this in, in an essay for the Algonquin Reader, which Algonquin Books puts out for to accompany uh, the, the novels. Yeah, and um, uh, m m uh, my family is just full of twins. My mother's a twin. My great grandfather was a twin. What? Aunt and uncle twins, nephew and niece twins, and I've always sort of paid homage to that in books. Just sort of a nod, having. Uh, twins, but I, I've always wanted, thought I could explore uh, twinship at at greater length, and uh, so I thought I'd try it with this book. And then there was also an incident, this was years ago, uh, I was in a bookstore, my wife and I were at a bookstore for a promotional event, and there was a restaurant attached to the bookstore, and the bookstore owner decided to have a meal, he invited I think 20 people from the community. And um, it was a great meal, great restaurant, a great meal. And uh, after the meal was over, he came over to me and said, okay, you can start your presentation now. And I, I didn't know I was doing a pre presentation. So I just tried to stall for time. So I said, okay, let's, the book I had written was about a, a teenage male who gets in various kinds of trouble. So I said, let's just go around the table and everyone can tell about what is the scariest or most embarrassing or stupidest thing you did as a teenager. And everybody wanted to tell something. It was just <laughs> it was astonishing. And, and one older fellow said his, his story was, um, he'd been an exchange student when he was in high school and he was in Japan and he fell in love with a girl over there, but she was a twin and his, dilemma was that he couldn't tell which twin he was in love with. Um, I sort of have doubts about that. I mean, I, it seems to me, you, <laughs> okay, you, you could tell. You it could, makes a good story, keep going. <laughs> it makes a great story, it makes a great story. Uh, but I think that something started percolating with that. And so initially I thought mm, maybe two brothers she's in love. No, no, it's the two brothers who are both in love with her. Her. And um, that's that's how it started. And you just started playing with it from there. What does your process look like when you start getting that, when you get that seed, that kernel, the muse comes to you, however you, you phrase it, what does that process look like? Where do you go from there? Um, nowhere, not for years, <laughs> not for years with this, with this book. Um, you know, I, I uh, thought about it for a long time. Sometimes I'll get an idea and an opening and I'll start writing soon after. But this one I, I thought about for a long time. And the process is always some sort of seed as you mentioned, uh, but then some other things begin to attach themselves to that or I start making some decisions, maybe doing a little rehearsing with language, trying to make some decisions about voice or style, mm -hmm. certainly point of view, setting. And then when I feel as though I have enough, and I certainly don't have the whole story, um, then I'm ready to go. And, and I'm, I'm making it up as I go along. I don't know how it's gonna end when I start. And um, I write very slowly, one sentence at a time, yeah. Are you one of those writers that writes every day and, and or is it kind of come to you in spurts? It, it, from slowly, it seems to me like it's something you'd like to take your time with. Um, yeah, I, I do write every day um, and it comes to me not as a spurt, but as a sort of as a trickle. As a trickle. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. Um, uh, but yeah, I don't miss a day. I, I make sure I write every day. And so you talked about, you mentioned setting and I wanna talk about this town in Montana and it seems mm -hmm. to be its own character in it and I want, to know what is interesting to you about this sort of small town Montana where there's, I don't know, tension around every corner. So it's like this, there's this kind of, in Denver, we have like the smog that comes in, <laughs> in, the, in Denver. And I think about the tension of the book felt very much like that in this town. What was appealing about that to you? And, and what made you want to write about this small town Montana? Yeah. Uh, well, I'd written about it before. Um, yeah. my, my novel, As Good As Gone, is also set in my, in my fictional town of Gladstone. Um, you know, once you 
create a community, and this happened too with, with uh, Montana 1948. Uh, there my, my created imaginary community was, was Bent Rock, but I do make sure that I, I locate, locate them at a specific place. I mean, and, um, but part of it is um, a kind of uh, knowledge of, of what life is like in those places. Uh, some sort of cultural awareness. Um, and then once I have it imagined, I, there's a part of me that just wants to stay there because I know what the town is like. I know which way the streets run. I know where people shop for their groceries. I know what their, their houses look like. I know what kinds of clothes they wear. And knowing many of these things then allows me to imagine freely about some other things because some of that work then has already been <clears throat> has been taken care of for me right and that being said just talking about setting and and, and voice and character and you know different parts of this story that you've come that you've pulled together i want to talk about time period as a setting because you've got three very distinct time periods of the 60s the 80s and the aughts and i'm curious i have two questions with this of why those time periods? Because you could have shifted it back 10 years, forward 10 years, and it would have made for a completely different story in each yeah. of your little parts. So what was appealing about that? And then also, what's is there any significance between the 20 years between each one? Well, sure, there's a bunch of things um, going on there. Um, 1967, I can remember 1967. So. <laughs> That's fair. I can, yeah, I can I can set a story there. Um, there is an incident very early in the novel with uh, Roy and Edie when they are on the road. Uh, Roy is is uh, going off to uh, buy a truck, mm -hmm. and he takes Edie along so that she can drive his vehicle back to Gladstone. And um, that's something that I used to do with my uncle. Um, uh, he'd go off to some small town in North Dakota and take me along in case he was able to purchase a car there, which he did for a friend of his who had a um, car dealership. And so I was along to be a, be a driver. And, and I did that around the time of 1967. Um, it was a great year too. It had great music and, um, and so some of it is being able to do the math. And then I wanted uh, Edie to be in a very different place. And I mean, not just a geographical place, but a different sort of emotional place, some different place in her life. And I thought uh, uh, 20 years would, would do it. And so she has a teenage daughter then, she's settled into a marriage. Um, so anything that happened then was going to be a major disruption. You know, if, if it, something happens in 1967 and then something happens in 1969, it, it almost feels like a, a, a continuation. But if, you're, if it's a 20 year interval, it's, it's, a, real, it's a real break. Mm -hmm. And yet it allows you to see how somebody can be the same and different. Yeah, exactly. I, like I said, for me, it, the time periods were really fascinating because as a with a female protagonist in those time periods and to see her evolve with the times in that was just very interesting and and so when i was thinking about it i was like oh i wonder why it wasn't 1977 1997 and 2017 you know and and that's that's just interesting to me um as to why those were their timelines but yes and 20 20 years is a huge difference for any character um and i'm I want to know a little bit about, mm, I'm trying to figure out how to, how to phrase this, but like when you're writing, a lot, so a lot of writers write for themselves and write this stories that they want to tell. What is something though that you would, you hope that people take away from this book when you read it? Not necessarily a moral, but what, is there anything you want them to get out of it or want them to pick up on maybe? Um. Sure, uh, you know, and and uh, I can't say that I was necessarily thinking about this in the act of writing some of these things. I discover myself in the course of a story that that 
seems to be asking me to be told. Um, but certainly there's something in it about uh, male and female relationships. Mm -hmm. There's something in there about mother and daughter relationships. Um, I think there is definitely something in the book about how culture, um, the culture of a place can have an effect on those relationships. Mm -hmm. Sure, those are some of the things uh, that I those are great themes. got to, yeah. Yeah, and then what about for you? What did, did you learn anything from writing this book? I, this is your, you know, you've written 10 books and, yeah. and this one's come out here. Is Do you learn something different with each book? Do you try something different with each book? I know some authors like to challenge themselves with each story. What sure. was different every, about this one for you? Yeah, yeah. Every book that I write is, is uh, an experiment. I mean, it might not seem wildly avant-garde, um, but um, I'm, I'm always trying an experiment, something new with each book. And this book's experiment was more than anything else. Um, it had to do with, with narrative modes. I tried to see how much of the story I could tell uh, with dialogue and action. Uh, there is some interiority in this book, but really not a lot. Uh, um, and um, it might have been, you mentioned earlier that a, a book of mine is, has been made into a film and it might have something to do with conversations that I had with a director and screenwriter of that film and, and comparing what it is to make a movie as opposed to writing a novel. And I began to think about what it is that filmmakers have to do. I mean, they have to show everything. They have to do it with with dialogue and action, and even their their landscape shots have to do something that relates to character. At least I think it does in the in in the best films. And so I was trying for a kind of approximation for that. A friend of mine said, "Oh, you know, this novel uh, seemed very cinematic to me," and uh, I, I was really pleased by that. That's definitely a, a quality I wanted. That leads beautifully into my next question, which was because I felt very similarly. Again, theater major, reading plays, dialogue is huge for me in expressing character. And I want to know what attracts you to the novel as a form of storytelling. And would you ever try other forms of storytelling? Um, I would like to try, but, <laughs> you know, uh, but uh, the novel is, is the form for me. Um, when I started writing a novel in uh, graduate school, I had to do, I was writing a novel for my dissertation. Um, the form just felt right to me immediately. I'd written short stories. I'd always struggled with uh, short stories. And I think the what it was about the novel was that I knew I, I, knew I had to fill a lot of pages. So that <laughs> meant I had to let things in. Mm -hmm. And with a short story, you're always thinking, eh, you know, and do I, can I get this in or do I leave it out? And with a novel, at least in that initial draft, I just said, if there's a decision to be made, leave it out or put it in, I'll put it in. And, um, and in doing that, I, I felt as though something opened up for me that hadn't previously in, in writing fiction. So what advice would you give as somebody who's studied story, written a lot of stories, have a lot of experience in it, what advice would you give for a budding novelist? Um, I think uh, find your own way, find your own way. Uh, I mean, there is so much advice out there and I used to offer a hell of a lot of it because I was teaching uh, creative writing, but there isn't a right way, mm -hmm. but there is a right way for you. And so um, don't be afraid to try out some things and to see if you can't find that, that right way. That's excellent advice, I think. And, and what's next for you? you? You've got this beautiful new novel that came out and, and that's exciting, but most often writers always have something spinning back here. Can you tell us a little bit about what your next thing might be? Give us a hint or a teaser? 
no, I can't. Hey! <laughs> Oh man! <laughs> uh, I, no, I'm always afraid if I say something that'll it'll, it'll go away. I'm working on a new novel. Yay! That's a great response. As long as you're still writing, that's what matters. Uh, well, we're gonna go ahead and open it up to questions now to our audience. So, um, if anybody has any questions, you can type them in the chat that's next to the video that you're watching on. Um, we already have some very active people in the chat already. So, someone named Chris would like to know, Larry. What song was referenced about the boy jumping off the bridge? And who would you like to say, see play Edie when? Oh, um, um, yeah, the, the song was, oh, sure. The song was, um, what's the name of it? Um, the Tallahatchie Bridge, the Billy Joe McAllister jumped off. My wife was here singing the song for me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mrs. Watson. <laughs> I, I get the title. Um, you know, Billy, uh, Bobby Gentry did the song. I listen Is to somebody Googling it right now. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. We don't have to uh, break out the song. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know who would who would play. Um, yeah, I don't know who would play Edie, yeah. Yeah, how much, I'm curious, it sounded like you had conversations with the screenwriter and the director. How much input did you have in the movie, if any? Because some authors just sign the rights away and then it goes off. What What did that look, process look like for you? Uh, I signed the rights away and then it went off. But okay. no, uh, <laughs> but the, the, the fellow who eventually wrote the screenplay and directed it um, talked to me before they'd purchased it and, um, okay. And he and I just got along great, uh, Tom Bazooka. And I, I liked him a lot. I respected him, I admired him. And I knew early on that he had a vision for the film. And it may not have been my vision. The, the plots of the movie and the book are quite similar, but I knew he had uh, something that he wanted to do. The mediums are so different. Um, and I trusted that I, I, I trusted him. I was just really happy that, that he was doing it. And I've seen the movie, it's terrific. Yeah. And I, I was right to, to, to trust him. Well, no, and that's really good to hear it because some authors talk about the process and don't have a lot of positive things to say. And the fact that you're able to talk about how Tom was able to create, to sort of keep the spirit of the book in this different medium means a lot. And it's a great endorsement of the film. Um, you've got some great leading leading actors in there, so it's, it's exciting. Mm -hmm. um, and also, like you said, trying different mediums, I'm sure it was a really interesting conversation between the two of you. Um, do you have a favorite of your novels and what was the most challenging novel to write? Those don't have to be the same. I think they're two yeah. separate questions. Uh, yeah. No, I don't have a favorite, but probably Montana 1940. Yeah, that's fair. It it um, it made so many things possible. It opened up so many things for me. And I don't mean that just in terms of publishing, but it certainly did that. Um, but it made me aware of, of a style, of a setting, of a cast of characters. Um, and I've returned to that territory in other books. So I'm, I'm uh, yeah, I'm, I'm particularly grateful to that novel. Yeah. And then what was uh, most challenging? Oh, um, it might have been the novel that finally was published as Laura. Um, I worked on that book for so long. In fact, I had finished that manuscript before Montana 1948. Uh, it just wouldn't come right. Um, I had a manuscript that was over 600 pages and it was just a big mess and, and um, and probably I needed to set it aside. And when I did, I was able to see some things that it needed. Yeah. yeah. Um, Edie's daughter is important in the second novella, but largely, largely absent in the third. Was that intentional? Does it reflect 64-year-old Edie's relationship with her? Uh, yes, it was intentional. I mean, I, I probably to say they are estranged is, is maybe going too far. But um, they they definitely are not um, uh, a part of each other's lives, 
and um, so um, yeah, it was it was deliberate, and and then it also it also made some room for for Edie's granddaughter too. Mm -hmm. I've been uh, yeah, <laughs> without giving away too much. Um, what there's a very interesting cyclical nature to this story. Um, do you, in terms of the twins and yeah, um, and the trios, um, what what do you think that says about history repeating itself and the lessons that we learn from our elders? Oh, um, sometimes I think it means that we don't learn the lessons, and so certain things keep repeating themselves. Uh, but yes, you're right. There's uh, certain patterns recur in the novel: the road trips. Mm -hmm. um, the the pairs of brothers um, so uh, there's it's it's sort of twinning in in structure as well as as in in character and um, yeah I uh, it was deliberate after I noticed that I'd done it a few times I yeah. decided yeah I guess the material is trying to tell me something here and I'm gonna I'm gonna follow through with that. I love how instinctual of a writer you seem to be of just kind of following where the characters take you and following where the themes take you. That's just really refreshing and interesting to hear. Um, another question is about the title. Did you come up with the title? Um, or if not, how did it come to be? Uh, no, I did not come up with the title. I'm a terrible titler. Uh, <laughs> oh no! <laughs> of, of my books, I think maybe one has the title that was mine, maybe right from the from the start. No, my my uh, working title for this was Edie and the Linderman Twins. And oh. again, that made more sense when, when um, the novel was just that first part with mm -hmm. Edie and the Linderman Twins. Uh, no, I got a lot of help from my editor with with the lives of Edie Pritchard. Editors are wonderful like that. <laughs> I, I had a really good one. Yeah. What was it like writing from a female protagonist's perspective? Um, it was like writing. Uh, you know, I, I wasn't thinking that I was writing about women. I was writing about this woman. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, I mentioned earlier, I could sort of hear her talking and uh, see the way she behaved very early on in the book. So I felt as though I could trust my impulses when it came to writing Edie Pritchard. When did you get bit by the writing bug? Oh, um, pretty early on. Um, um, I think I had writerly in intentions or aspirations before I started writing. I didn't really do any writing until I was in college. And then okay. I took a class, um, started writing poetry. The poems were terrible, but uh, <laughs> it felt good to make them. I mean, I didn't know I could do that. And so I wanted to keep that feeling in my life. What did you think you were gonna do before college? If I can ask, before you discovered writing and that talent that you had. Yeah, um, I started college saying uh, pre-law. Ooh. <laughs> yeah, my father, okay. was an attorney. my father was an attorney, so I knew that that was something that a grown-up could do. Uh, it was, it, you know, I, I knew it wasn't likely to happen, but, yeah. you know, you got to put something down on the forms. What are some of your tricks for overcoming writer's block? Um, I don't have it. And I don't have it because okay. I keep my standards very low. Uh, I just insist that I write something every day. I think often what people mean when they talk about writer's block isn't that they can't think of something to write, but that they can't think of something good to write. And of course, it's not good or bad before you write it. It's not anything until you put it down okay. on paper. Yeah. Uh, but once you do, you can make it better. But you know, if you wait until you're sure whether it's gonna be good or not, you'll just keep waiting. So I'll accept anything that comes out of my, my pen or out of my 
fingers um, and with, uh, with the knowledge that, that as long as I get something down, I can try to make it better. And then writing every day um, helps too. Yeah. Oh, I'm sure, because it keeps those muscles prime and strong all the time. Oh, what does um, what does a typical writing day look like for you? You say you write every day. Are you an early writer? Do you wait until your wife's gone to bed? What, what does that look like for you? Uh, you know, uh, right now it's uh, mostly afternoons, writing in the afternoons. Um, you know, I'd like to get started <laughs> earlier in the day, but I just can't quite seem to do it. And uh, since I retired, I have this um, mistaken notion that I have more time than I actually do. So uh, I'm perhaps <laughs> less efficient with the use of my time than I was when I was teaching. Mm -hmm. uh, but usually by early afternoon, I've I've uh, started writing. Uh, you know, uh, two hours is a long session for me. I can do some other things related to writing around that, but for uh, actual writing, yeah. Yeah. Um, what are you reading right now? Another way I like to phrase that is what media are you consuming during COVID? Because <laughs> some uh, people uh, it's not books, some people it's, you know, TV shows or what, what are you, what are you, what are you consuming during COVID? Uh, 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 books and television, good television. There's just so much good television. Uh, uh, Do you have some recommendations? Television and movies. Um, uh, so my wife and I will watch something in the evenings and we're both reading during the day. Uh, a couple books I've read recently that really impressed me. Um, Louise Erdrich's The Night Watchman. I thought that was oh, yes. wonderful. Um, a book by Daniel Mendelssohn called uh, The Lost. Uh, it's sort of memoir, detective story, Holocaust mm -hmm. history. Um, those are a couple. I'm just gonna like just start jotting down my list as if I don't already have so many I have to read. <laughs> no, that's no, that's good to hear. It's we love always hearing from other authors what's on their nightstand or you know what what what's what they're reading right now too. And, so. and since I mentioned twins, uh, I'm also yeah. reading uh, Kathleen Shine's The Grammarians, which is about twins. Okay. Uh, 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 I just love her work, and and uh, this book is is hilarious and insightful and uh, moving. So yeah, that's another one. No, that's, again, excellent to always hear. Uh, let's see here. And when I have a chance to listen to music, I often like- Oh to, yeah, that's um, another form of media, absolutely. I, I often like to listen to songs from the 1960s, such as Ode to Billy Joe. <laughs> ah, there it is. <laughs> yeah, Thank, thanks, Ellie. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. Um, do you listen to music while you write? Just out of curiosity. Yeah, yes, I do. Yeah. And is it, and is your environment, do you usually do it like in an office or do you like to go outside? Is, do you have a preferred setting for yourself? Uh, I don't have a preferred setting. It's usually in my office, but um, you know, I can, I can write anywhere as long as I have the material at hand. That's awesome. Um, I'm, I'm looking up, we're seeing if we have any more questions here. Um, it doesn't look like it, but I, I also just want to say thank you for a really wonderful novel and a, a sense of escape that was really great during COVID and very fascinating for me. Um, I have never been to Montana and <laughs> it sounds like kind of a cool but scary place at the same time. <laughs> but I, I really did enjoy this and, and I definitely recommend it to anyone um, who's looking just for a really thoughtful novel. And like I said, for me, the structure was something that I really enjoyed. The fact that um, we could get a whole lifetime in just three acts. And that was, I really appreciated that. And so thank you for sharing your work with us. And thank you for continuing to do that and, and gifting us with, with your voice and, and those words. We, I know that I'm not gonna be the only one who appreciates it for sure. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah, you're yeah. welcome. Thank you very much. Should Absolutely. we do the, the reveal now about the Kenosha connection? Oh my gosh, yeah. <laughs> well, I, I was going to ask you afterwards. But okay. So, we've, so Larry and I found out that both of us, uh, 
Larry lives in Kenosha, Wisconsin, and that I went to school in Kenosha, Wisconsin. And so we spent this whole time earlier talking about it, but I was thinking about it. And I was like, it's, if you live in Wisconsin, there's a really important question in Kenosha that I got asked all the time, which was Packers or Bears? Uh, Packers. <laughs> There it is. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> I figured being from Milwaukee, that was your answer. Yeah, yeah. But in Kenosha, it's a huge debate. <laughs> yes, it is. Yeah. Yes. So we were reminiscing about all sorts of restaurants and places that we wish we could go. <laughs> but things things are still kind of closed down now, unfortunately. So, yeah. Someday. Well, I, Someday. I, I'm i sorry? Someday. Someday. Exactly. Yeah. We'll, we'll have to meet up at, at why not. Uh, <laughs> but I, I want to just remind everybody that the Lives of Edie Pritchard is out now and it's you can purchase it at tatteredcover.com. And I just, once again, I really encourage people to get it. You can either purchase it online right now or you can go into our stores and pick up a copy. Um, tomorrow is when we're open at our Colfax and Lodo stores and Aspen Grove's open seven days a week. Larry, I want to give you just a minute if there's anything you want to share with anybody or you know to let people know where they can find you online or anything else you'd like to add before we close out sure thank you yeah um, sure uh, at my website and and um, it has links to some stores and something about my books and uh, send me an email from there too yeah Absolutely. Well, and my name is Michaeli. I work with Tattered Cover Bookstore. Um, thank you guys again. Once again, I know that we cannot be together in person at this time, but thank you for joining us. You will be able to continue. You'll be able to watch this. So for if any reason you missed a bit of it or you want to share it with your friends on social media, please do use the same link that you're watching on it right now and the recording will be available. Uh, once again, tattercover.com, you can order The Lives of Edie Pritchard. Larry, I'm gonna ask you to stay on real quick here while even though we'll cut the feed, but thank you everyone. Please stay safe and happy reading. And we're out. <laughs>